it's moments like this when you really feel proud that you're an American. Uh, I, I must confess that in the last few weeks, I've been watching and listening to the Republican presidential debates and secretly filling forms to migrate to Sweden, to Canada, to Norway. But now I will go back and delete all those forms. <laughs> <laughs> I'm also glad that neither Hillary nor Bernie Sanders are watching the speech that you gave, Governor. Thank you very much for a very eloquent uh, expression of what this conference is all about. Uh, our next speaker is Senator Carper. Senator Carper has come to share with us a lot of thoughts. He told me he's prepared to speak for 30 minutes, but he's going to speak only for 15 minutes. But I'm very grateful for him uh, for agreeing to speak, and uh, I look forward to hearing you, Senator. Thank, thank you, Dr. Khan, and to our distinguished uh, head table guests, to our governor, our congressman, to Brian, to others uh, that, uh, that have joined us here today. Dr. Khan told me how long you prepared to speak, and I said, two hours. <laughs> so I could probably cut it back to about 150. Maybe we're lucky 145. But, uh, but seriously, it, it, uh, I, I told him I was prepared to talk for 30 minutes, but I'd probably be able to get it done in 15. And I said, it'll seem like 30, but it'll only really be maybe 15 uh, years. How many of you were born outside of the US? How many of you were born outside of the US? That's, that's good. How many of you were born in West Virginia? I was, just, I was born in West Virginia. How many of you were born or grew up in Virginia? I grew up in Virginia. How, I, how many won a Navy ROTC scholarship and went to Ohio State and became a Naval Flight Officer? That would be me. That would be me. I was born in uh, January of uh, 19, uh, 1947, and uh, I uh, was born in West Virginia. And uh, I was born uh, about uh, 18 months really about 18 months after the end of, uh, of World War II. And my, uh, my dad had uh, served as a, an enlisted man in World War II. He was a chief petty officer in the, uh, the Navy. Uh, all my uncles, uh, except for one who later served in the Korean War, but all of my uncles uh, served in uh, World War II. Uh, some were in the Navy, uh, some were in the, uh, the Army. Uh, my dad and, uh, and my uncles uh, came back at the end of the war except for one. Uh, my mom's uh, youngest brother uh, was a, uh, on the deck of a uh, U.S. Uh, Air Force, or U.S. Uh, Navy uh, carrier called the Sewanee in 1944. He's 19 years old. And they were attacked by kamikaze uh, uh, planes from the Japanese. They attacked the, uh, the, uh, the aircraft carrier. And my uncle and a number of other uh, seamen who were on the, uh, the deck of the ship that day uh, were killed. Their bodies were, were never recovered. The uh, person who was the... Uh, president at, uh, at that time was uh, Franklin Roosevelt. And later, before the war would end, he would die. And another fellow would become president uh, named, named uh, Harry Truman. And in a minute, I want to share with you some of, uh, just one thing, one I think especially important thing that he said uh, to, uh, to us in this country, gosh, maybe 70 years ago. The, uh, you may recall that World War II began uh, on December 7th, 1941. Today is December 5th, Monday is December 7th. And it will have been, gosh, you do the math, 70, 74 years on Monday since that fateful day. Thousands of American sailors were, uh, were killed in a surprise attack by the Japanese in Pearl Harbor in Hawaii. Uh, the U.S. Uh, Naval flipped the Pacific Fleet uh, lay in ruins at the end of, uh, of the day. And uh, on the heels of, uh, of the, yeah, that attack by the, uh, the Japanese, uh, millions of Americans would answer the call to arms and enlist and sign up to serve in the Army, the Navy, the Air Force, the Marines. We didn't even have an Air Force, it was the Army Air Force. And people served as merchant mariners and people served in the Coast Guard. The, uh, at the same time that they were sending forward to, uh, to defend our country, uh, an order went out uh, not for people to, uh, to enlist and join our armed forces. The order went out for, uh, for people of Japanese descent to show up and turn themselves in, to leave their uh, homes, to leave their uh, farms, to leave their businesses, in some cases to leave their families, 
in order to uh, report for a different kind of duty, a different kind of duty. And uh, some would call it an imprisonment, some uh, call it an internment, but uh, that's where most of them spent, or many of them spent, World War II. Not every one of them. Some uh, were repatriated back to Japan. Some uh, made the decision to move from the West Coast, where most of the internment took place, to go to the East Coast. Some uh, decided to uh, actually enlist in the United States uh, Army. A lot of them just hunkered down and uh, stayed there in these internment camps, overcrowded, poor living conditions, uh, until the war would end in 1946. In 1944, the U.S. Supreme Court uh, issued a ruling, and the ruling that the Supreme Court issued basically said, this ain't right. Talk about social justice. This is not what our country's all about. And began the, uh, the release, if you will, of the folks that were in these internment camps, and the last of them left in 1946. Believe it or not, the most uh, decorated unit for its size and, and length of service in the history of American warfare, I'll say this again, the military unit most decorated for its size and for its length of service in the history of the United States it was an outfit called the Army's 442nd Regimental Combat Team, a unit of the United States Army. It was comprised almost entirely of soldiers of Japanese descent. They served in Europe, especially served in uh, Italy and southern France and in Germany. There was a unit that had 4,000 men who served. They were in some of the toughest fighting of the war in Europe. Many of them would die, others would be badly wounded, and their numbers turned over two and a half times during the course of the last two years of the war because of death and because of people who were badly, badly wounded. During uh, the course of uh, that war, the 14,000 men who served in the 442nd Combat Regiment, uh, the 14,000, listen to this, 9,486 of them earned Purple Hearts. 9,486 earned Purple Hearts. And that's not all. This unit earned the Presidential Distinguished Unit Award not once, not twice, not three or four or five or six times, not seven times, but eight times. Eight times. The Distinguished Unit of the United States Army. Five times in one month. Five times in one month. And while they were fighting and dying for our freedom as a nation, many of their families, many of their families, served out the rest of the war, not in a uniform, but in an internment camp, because of the fear that folks had in this country that somehow those Japanese would turn on us and, and wreck, uh, wreck havoc. One of, the, uh, one of the people who served in uh, that unit was a fellow named Danny Inouye. Danny Inouye. He didn't just serve, he was one of the 21 members of the 442nd who received the Presidential Medal of Honor. There's no higher honor for those who serve in, in the military. He lost his arm, not his life. Came home eventually, at the end of the war, got an education, he became, when Hawaii became a state, he became the first uh, U.S. congressman, U.S. representative, the job that Don, John Carney holds in service to, uh, to our country to today. Served for a couple of years, later became a United States senator. Only one person in the history of the country died a couple of years ago. He served until his death. I was privileged to serve with him for a number of years. Only one person in the history of our country has served longer in the U.S. Senate than Dan Inouye. Only one person, Robert Byrd. Another fellow who served uh, in, um, in that uh, same period of time in the military, 
was another fellow who, with whom I served, previously had served in the Congress, a fellow named Dan Arcaca. In World War II, his job was uh, to serve in the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, helping to build things that help us to build and to actually win the war. I don't know if it seems uh, ironic or maybe cruel to you that the idea while the, uh, the men of the 442nd and the men of Danny Akaka's Army Corps of Engineers team were risking their lives, giving their lives, to defend freedom in this country, their families lost their freedom. Lost their freedom. Harry Truman once said, uh, later after the war was over, he said these words. I'll paraphrase him, but the only thing that's new in the world is the history we forgot or never learned. Think about that. The only thing that's new in the world is the history we forgot or never learned. What do we uh, take from uh, that sad chapter of our nation's life. When 100,000, more than 100,000 people who love this country, they just happen to be of Japanese descent, many of whom serve valiantly in defense of this country, and yet uh, think of the way that we treated them. What do we learn from that? Is, that still, is there still a lesson there for all of us? You bet there is. You bet there is. And uh, we uh, had better not forget it. We had better not forget it. I want to go back uh, even further in time. I want to go back, uh, go back with me 2,000 years. None of us were around. We're not even a gleam in our uh, father's or mother's eye. 2,000 years ago, Jewish rabbi, a young guy, was uh, being uh, inquisitioned by a bunch of folks called Pharisees. They're trying to get him in trouble with the Roman authorities. And uh, they said to him one day, look, you're so smart, rabbi. Rabbi means teacher. He said, you're so smart, rabbi. Why do you tell us what is the uh, most important, uh, the greatest commandment of all? And he looked at him and he said, there's not one, there's actually two. There's not one, there's actually two. And I said, all right, what are they? And he said, the first is the love of the Lord thy God with all thy heart, all thy soul, and all thy mind. And he said, well, what's the second one? And he said, the second is to love thy neighbor as thyself. And they asked him the question, they said, well, who is our neighbor? And he told them a parable, he told them a story about the Good Samaritan that many of us have, have heard what other faith that we are from, the story of the Good Samaritan, to illustrate that we're all one another's neighbors. In the end, we're all one another's neighbors. And the, uh, the reminder he gave us that day and 2,000 years later, it still resonates, is we have a moral obligation to treat other people the way we want to be treated. That's social justice. Wherever they come from, whatever walk of life, we have an obligation to put ourselves in their shoes and treat them the way we would want to be treated. That's a 2,000 year old lesson. And we need to remember that one today too. And as it turns out, the golden rule, which is what we call it, the golden rule, isn't just uh, present in uh, the Bible. It's also in the Quran, and I actually, uh, we actually uh, we looked up some, uh, some words, and just some of this may sound familiar to, to, to you, but this is, this, is the, this is what we find in, in the faith of Islam, their version of the golden rule. No one of you is a, quote, no one of you is a believer until he desires for his brother that which he desires for himself. The Jewish faith, John's Catholic, Governor's Jewish, Tom is Presbyterian Protestant. The Jewish faith, they say it uh, just a, a little bit better. Uh, don't do unto others the things that you wouldn't want to have done to yourself. This is an international, international commandment, almost regardless of our faith. In every faith, we find these words, or words similar to them. The other words that, uh, that we find in, uh, in the New Testament I'm a Presbyterian. Our pastor reminds us of this about every, uh, every other week. So the New Testament, the first book of the New Testament is called Matthew. Some of you know Matthew 25. And there's a passage there about the least of these. The least of these. And it goes something like this. When I was hungry, did you feed me? 
When I was thirsty, did you give me to drink? When I was naked, did you clothe me? When I was a stranger in your land, did you welcome me? That's 2,000 years old. And for me, I hope for, for you, that's, uh, those are words that still resonate with me and frankly need to resonate with all of us. When I was a stranger in your land, did you welcome me? We have uh, a couple of competing priorities here. At least some people think that we do. We have, I think, a moral obligation to the least of these, the folks that are hungry, thirsty, naked, homeless, a stranger in our lands. We have a moral obligation to the least of these. And at the same time that we try to meet that moral obligation, especially to the strangers in our land, we have a moral obligation to make sure that in doing that, we don't somehow put in, in harm's way the folks that are already here, that are American citizens. And some people say, you can't do that. We can't do both. We cannot meet the moral obligation to those who come to this country, who want to come to this country, and at the same time meet the, uh, the moral obligation that we have to provide security to all of us who, who live here. I think that's a false choice. I think that's a false choice. I think we can do both, and we need to do both. I'll close with this. I'm privileged to, uh, to serve with Senator Coons, Chris Coons in the United States Senate. He serves on a bunch of committees. I serve on several. Congressman Carney does as well. One of the committees I serve on is called the Committee on Homeland Security and Governmental Affairs. People say, what uh, keeps you up awake? They say, well, first of all, what's it like to, I was the chairman of the Homeland Security Committee the last two years. They say, what's it like to be the chairman of the Homeland Security Committee? I say, it's a busy neighborhood. It's a busy neighborhood. There's a lot of bad stuff going on around the world. And frankly, a lot of people who want to do great harm to us. It's a busy neighborhood. But I, uh, I don't worry about the, the folks who are refugees, whether they're coming out of Syria or some other place. I think there are four million refugees uh, coming out of Syria who would like to have some place to go. And uh, some of them would like to come here. Uh, we can't take four million people. The president says uh, we'll take about 2,000 this year, another 10,000 maybe next year. And then we'll see what uh, the future brings. In the meantime, we provide more money for folks that are refugees in any nation on earth. I think we could feel good about that. But let me just tell you this. For those that are fearful of the refugees who might come here, here's, uh, out of those four million, the United Nations uh, vets a bunch of them who express some interest in coming to the U.S. And they vet maybe 23,000 in the last year or two who expressed out of 4 million some interest in coming to the U.S. Out of the 23,000, 7,000 names, mostly children, families, older folks. Actually, uh, out of that 23,000, 7,000 get vetted to the, by the U.S. And out of the 7,000, we've chosen 2,000. Again, mostly women, children, families, older people. And out of the 2,000 people that uh, have settled uh, here out of the, so we started with 4 million, the 23,000 to 7,000, we eventually say we'll take in two, and they're here, and they're here. And the number that uh, have been charged or convicted with any kind of crime or riot related to terror, let me hear you say zero. zero. Let me hear you say zero. zero. That's the number, that's the number. We have a program called the Visa Waiver System that uh, allows, actually facilitates tra travel in between us and 38 other countries. It's pretty tight. We're tightening it up further. And we have folks that come here on student, student visas and tourist visas. And we are very mindful of the, the dangers that they can pose to, to all of us. And uh, we are vigilant, and we're doing our dead level best to meet our second imperative to protect the security of our people. Last one, word I want to say is, is this. Congressman Carney and uh, our governor have heard me say probably too many times that I love to ask uh, people who have been married a long time what's the secret to be married a long time. And I get some really funny answers. 
Really funny answers. Last week, I talked to this one couple. I said, uh, what's the secret? They've been married almost 55 years. I said, what's the secret? And the wife said, standing next to her husband, she said, he's gone a lot. And I said, what do you think the secret is, sir? And he said, well, I am gone a lot. Another couple I asked not long ago, they've been married almost 60 years. And I said, what do you all think the, uh, the secret is? And the, uh, the wife said, a good sense of humor. And the husband, I think, said just a bad memory, a poor memory. <laughs> uh, the best answer uh, that I think I've ever heard, though, was the, uh, the two C's, not Carper and Carney, not Carper and uh, Coons, but uh, communicate and compromise. And that's really good. And uh, I've added a third C uh, in, the, in the meantime. And the third C is to collaborate, to collaborate. And that's not just the secret for a long marriage between two people. That's also the secret for vibrant democracy. Think about that. To communicate, to compromise, and to collaborate. I just want to thank Dr. Khan and everybody who's put together today's uh, assembly. And thank you for inviting all of us to come and to be here with, uh, with you. I want to thank each of you for, for joining us. The Department of Homeland Security has a program and I think it's a good program. And it's a partnership with communities uh, of the, uh, the, uh, the Muslim faith. And the idea is to, uh, not just to try to be tracking people down and arresting people and everything, but actually working as a partnership to say, all this social media that's going on by our, those folks at ISIS that are trying to radicalize people in this country, let's just work together to make sure that they're not successful. And while we degrade and seek to destroy them on the battlefield, let's work in a cooperative way here in this uh, country and com community to community to make sure that uh, this country that has uh, endured for all these years, has endured for all these years, uh, will be around for a whole lot longer. December 7th was not only Pearl Harbor Day, as the governor knows and John Carney knows, uh, December 7th was also the, uh, it's called Delaware Day. And it's called Delaware Day because uh, it was on December 7th, 1787, 228 years ago, this Monday. 25 or so uh, men gathered in Dover, Delaware. Dover, Delaware, just south of us here. And they'd spent uh, three days reading this constitution for a new country that had been written up the road in Philadelphia by representatives from 13 colonies. And they read it, debated it, argued about it for day one and day two. And at the end of day three, they said, let's ratify this. Let's agree to this. And they did. 228 years ago on Monday in Dover, Delaware, the Golden Fleece Tavern. And uh, the uh, preamble, the very beginning of the Constitution, uh, is something that I had to learn when I was in, uh, in school. And uh, maybe some of you did, too, if you went to elementary school or middle school or high school here. And I'm not going to ask uh, everybody to repeat the whole thing. But I do want to ask you to join me in saying the very first sentence of the preamble to the Constitution. And it uh, goes something like this. I'll say a few words, and I would invite you to, to participate and repeat after me. We the people of the United States of America, in order to form a more perfect union. It, do, it didn't say, or doesn't say, in order to form a perfect union. It says in order to form a more perfect union. This experiment in democracy is 228 years old. It is a tough way to govern. Winston Churchill likes to say, liked to say that democracy is the worst form of government devised by wit of man, except for all the rest. It's a hard way to govern. We've been at it for 228 years. We welcome people from all over the world in this experiment. And hopefully together, we'll make uh, our founding fathers and those who follow us proud of our efforts. God bless you. Thank you so much.